So, say 1.1 is what everybody's done. 1.2 is the most recent release. Um, nobody has to be a, a compliant with that yet. It comes up in January, well, I suppose tonight, January 2009, so we are now. It wasn't a major change from 1.1. It just said you now need to encrypt data on your public wireless networks. Oh, there's a surprise, seeing as that's how TJ Maxx got uh, uh, compromised. But this is moving forward as well. We've got PCI 2.0 coming up maybe later this year, early next year, and it's likely to be a larger change, a broader change. Again, looking at wireless uh, networks, but there is also some talk of them starting to look at the card uh, capture devices as well, which are seen as a, um, a weakness. So taking a study that was done quite recently by Improvata, um, is your company compliant with PCI DSS, even though they're supposed to be? Um, Two-thirds, almost, were not. So the question there is, are you as organizations, are you yet compliant with PCI DSS? Again, local poll, can you uh, just take a moment to, to click one of the buttons and, and hit submit, please? That's good. 13% there are nice and confident. Yes, we are compliant. Uh, but the vast majority um, are either not or are not sure. Uh, and I would suggest that's a worrying place to be, uh, say that, as this can have a significant impact on, on your business and how to uh, uh, do business. So on that topic, why should you actually do something about this? So what? As I say, if you do not address this, it's possible at the extreme you could actually be totally barred from processing credit card transactions. Certainly can be fined for non-compliance. Uh, again, depending on how big you are, how bad the non-compliance is, anything from £2,500 to £500,000. Um, the risk of the transactions is passed from the credit authority, the, the card issuers, to yourselves if you are not compliant. You have to make good any bad transactions. That costs TJ Maxx a significant amount of money. Your charges per transactions increase, and of course you get the bad press and the brand um, um, issues. With, to go with it as well. So, what is it you actually need to do? Here are the data security standards. Here are the six primary areas and the 12 major requirements that you are need to be compliant with. As I say, not all of them are tech, can be addressed with technology. A large number can. But of those with, um, with uh, technology aspects, there is no one single vendor that can actually address all of these things. What you actually have to do is to do an initial and then an annual audit of your infrastructure and your systems to confirm you are compliant and you continue to be compliant. You need to be certified by auditors who again in themselves are certified by PCI that you are compliant. And these guys can also advise you on what action you need to take to become compliant. And finally, at 2010 is a deadline for acquirers to finalize compliance of all their merchants all the way down to level four. Beyond that point, you're opening yourselves up for fines and uh, increased transaction charges. So at this point, I shall pass over to my uh, colleague, James Anthony, and he'll start taking you through some of these uh, requirements and perhaps some of the things we can do to help you address them. James, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Alistair. As Alistair was saying, yeah, my name's James Anthony. I actually work as a technical specialist inside the group in, in Oracle that focuses on security and, and core technology security. So you can see here the, the six key areas that this is broken down into, the 12 requirements under that. But if any of you are interested, I suggest you actually go to the PCI Council website and download the self-assessment questionnaire box. A fairly large document that actually takes each of these 12 major requirements and breaks it down in a very prescriptive manner. And that's quite unusual for European legislation to actually be prescriptive in any way, much more in, in the vein of something like Solvain Doxy, which relied on the COVID standard, allowing you to actually go through a series of steps. And in some ways, you might initially look at the document and feel it's quite a big document to go to. But much of what's in there is very much common sense and perform a great platform for general. I'm going to look at the uh, first, two, first two here, which is install and maintain a firewall configuration and don't use a password. But clearly, Oracle don't do firewalls as such, so we don't do the typical 
firewalls you have out there. It will stop intruders coming in with that, that initial barrier between yourselves and the outside wall. But what we do have is a series of recommendations. And there's some links that are included in the slide deck if you choose to download it, such as the database security guide, our database security checklist, et cetera. It allows us to make sure defaults aren't in place and you follow what we're describing as best practice in there. One of the things that uh, I, I will also talk about in here is, is the ability we have to, to actually pick up some default passwords, et cetera, as well. And I'll deal with that when we get onto developing and maintaining a secure system. The next two I'm going to look at are actually protecting stored data and encrypting the transmission of data as we flow the data across the public networks. One of the things I was to refer to was the fact that TJ Maxx were actually compromised to a badly configured Wi-Fi network using the WET protocol. So the, the intruders broke into through one of their stores and then began to compromise more and more of the systems. The first thing we can do around protecting cardholder data is what you would class as real-time masking, so hiding key columns. And specifically, if you look at the DSS standard, what you'll find that they're looking for is hiding things like the PIN numbers, the credit card validation code, the credit card numbers in many cases themselves from people that shouldn't have access to that. So with virtual private database, which is a core function of the ENS private edition release of the database, we can hide both rows and columns from users depending on a context. This is what you may hear referred to as contextual authorization. So based on the context you are, the script access is Customers I've been working with, we've used this to say that people in the call center can't access credit card data. We've restricted rows from command line tools that DBAs may have, database administrators for those of you who are not aware. So they, they may have these command line tools such as SQL Plus, SQL Developer, Code, they're allowed to get large volumes of data in one go. We can actually restrict the credit card numbers, not show those columns, mask those columns out and just have to blank it out, depending on the tool the person is using. Why is that important? Well, Semantic did a study at the end of 2008 that suggested credit card numbers with the validation codes were exchanging hands from as little as 50 US cents up to about $12 for a card number not a lot of money in any way, shape, or form. So actually, the criminals here are intending to do this for profit purposes, and there's very little reason they could be doing other than profit. It doesn't make sense for them to take individual cards. It makes sense for them to go after where card data is stored in bulk. Clearly, databases are where the majority of card data is stored in bulk. The second thing we can do is actually encryption technology. So encryption is very good. It stands up in court. If you look at many of the US states that have legal obligations to disclose lots of data, if the data is encrypted, that legal obligation to disclose goes away. From an Oracle perspective, we have various pieces of technology that allow us to encrypt data throughout its entire life cycle. So at the database level, we have something called transparent data encryption. It allows us to encrypt even columns, so specifically thinking about credit card numbers, or entire table spaces, which is just a sort of bucket data like data goes in. We can protect the backups of the data dips or if the data tape from beyond there, which means that when we ship our tapes off to a third party, that tape is adequately protected. And that is another key requirement of the data security standard. The great thing with this is we don't have any application changes in any way, shape, or form here. 